Good afternoon or good morning, ladies and gentlemen, as the case may be. On behalf of the Institute for International and European Affairs, uh, I am delighted to welcome you to the lecture today by Susanna Malkora. My name is David Tunahu. Susanna Malkora is the former Minister for Foreign Affairs of Argentina. She also served as the chef de cabinet to Ban Ki-moon, the uh, former UN Secretary General, and uh, held a number of very senior posts within the UN system, including Chief Operations Officer at WFP and Under Secretary General at the Department for Field Support. She also had a very successful private sector career beforehand in Argentina, and Stan is currently the Dean of the IE School of Global and Public Affairs in Madrid. And we're really delighted to welcome you today, Susanna, to the Institute. Uh, Susanna will speak to us on the topic of confronting the long crisis uh, of the multilateral order. She'll make a presentation lasting for about 20 minutes, and we will then move into a Q&A session with the audience. Both parts of the program are on the record. Some other housekeeping points. You're very welcome to join the discussion by using the Q&A function, which you'll find uh, on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to send in your questions anytime they occur to you during the session, and we'll do our best to get to them. And please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So with that, Susanna, a warm welcome again, and over to you. Thank you, David. And it's a pleasure to see you again. You and I go back to New York when you were ambassador there, and I was a, the, the chef de cabinet of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So it's good to see you. And it's a, a really an honor to be here hosted by IIEA. I mean, it's an institute that is very well recognized. And um, I am very glad to have the opportunity to speak with you and through you with the whole audience that is behind. Um, when I was asked to, to speak um, in, in this context, somehow the idea was that I will speak about the multilateral system. And I made a, a very strong point that I was not going to speak about the multilateral system, but about the multilateral order. And let me make just the point here of why I, I make that strong distinction. Um, what, what we try to do here, what I try to do is not to talk about the reform of multilateral institutions per se, which of course should be part of a, a big strategy. But what I am trying to address is the deeper question of policy leading a, an influential states or coalition of states, the power behind all of this, which is, uh, of course, the, the order that establishes how we, we work together. So it's a broader sense of what multilateralism is, the one I'm going to try and address. And one more point that I would like to make, this thinking is based on the work that I'm doing with Bruce Jones from the Brookings Institution. And um, we, are, we have been working on this together, so I just want to, to make it public that uh, this is not something that I'm doing on, on my own, that Bruce is part of this, with this thinking. The first thing that I would like to refer to is the notion that people tend to believe that the crisis we are in is a recent crisis. And many refer to this crisis and associate this crisis to the arrival of President Trump in, in the US. Uh, I will say that this crisis has long roots and these roots have been, devel been developing for quite a few years. And it probably um, it is important to understand this, these roots and how much they have been lasting. Uh, the first thing I, I, I think we, one needs to recognize is that uh, in, in the past decade or more than a decade, there have been strong reversals in international peace and security. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the notion of cooperation that existed after World War and that led to, to what we recognize as one of the biggest values of the United Nations um, started to shift. And I will 
mark 9-11 as a big moment where that shift started to occur. And there we, we, we started to see the, the blur notion of what conflict was in the past, but was essentially conflict between states, moving to conflicts in an asymmetric way, conflicts between uh, states and terrorists, which is uh, something that we had to deal in, in a very different manner. And also the notion of intrastate conflict, which also blur with terrorism. So this changing pattern in peace and security really had an impact that affected the way the, the international uh, 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 response was able to come together and bring uh, solutions to the problem. So that's one first thing, how uh, the international peace and security system was addressed. The second thing that I, I believe has affected uh, the multilateral order is the reversals in political support for globalization. Uh, clearly, clearly, um, the notion that globalization uh, brought many of the problems that societies are facing, that globalization is the mother of all problems, the mother of uh, inequality, the, the mother of, of losing uh, uh, jobs, the, 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 the real reason behind many, many of the social and economic issues that societies face has been an important piece on, on how multi, the multilateral system started to, to lose a, a steam. Then together with this was a, the reversals that we have seen in the international capacity to provide global public goods. A, and this is interesting because COVID-19 has put value to, to this lack of capacity through the uh, many shortages that we saw uh, facing the pandemic regarding health. But the, the understanding of the value of global public goods, the erosion to the investment of global public goods, the, the weakening of the political support for global public goods is another element that in, in, in my view, in our view, together with Bruce, this has a, 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 a real impact. While all of this occurs, of course, there is a, a, a fast evolving technological change, which adds to uncertainty and uncertainty uh, leads to a notion of a um, protectionism, a uh, hankering down, closing boundaries, because uh, it's the way to, to go and to respond to the fear that societies have. So all of this has been, in our view, evolving for some time. It's not a single reason, it's not a single cause. And together with this, of course, there is the rise in geopolitical tensions, which of course adds to, the, to address some of the issues that in its, each one in, them, in itself was difficult to, to resolve. It's clear that um, uh, for the first time in, in nearly four decades, we now face the prospect of a serious military hostility between the world's major military power. We are, I'm not saying that this is likely to happen, but it's clear that there is a rising tension that leads to the perspective, to the prospect of hostilities. And this brings, without any doubt, China and the United States head to head, but also a US-Russian relations that, is, that are getting more, more and more tense, although uh, President Biden's meeting with President Putin might help in, in a way, but that those tensions and Russia getting a little bit closer to, to China 
adds to the idea of a, a, a potential military hostility. This geopolitical challenge exists on, on, on three levels. The first one is in, in itself a direct threat to international peace and security, no doubt. It's also a challenge to the liberal basis of post-Cold War for what will happen after World War II. And of course, it complicates efforts to solve all the problems that I have enumerated uh, above. So is, is the, the, the geopolitical challenge adds a dimension of complexity of risks that er can erode even farther cooperation on every single front that we are addressing here. Even climate change, for example, which the Biden administration has decided to, to uh, find a way to speak with US, uh, with China, uh, that in itself could be tainted by the, the tensions that are, are raising. So all of this leads to the continuous temptation to, to protectionism, to the, the, the very, very uh, deliberate a decision to renationalize several domains of technology, which could create a divide in the world, in a world that COVID has proven is more digital than ever before. And that divide could even yield more tensions, no question about it. Um, it's, it's clear that um, one of the, the biggest problem that competition brings is that um, we can get into uh, notions of zero sum game that will really hurt the ability to construct a, a world in the new technology realms that could be equitable and could be somehow shared by all. Um, so what do we do here? How do we how do we react to, it, to this? And the first thing is that, of course, um, there has been a change, and I refer to President Trump as not being the cause of all uh, problems that we face, that the, the problems were there before and were there beyond his, his presidency. But it's also true that the four years of, of President Trump's, Trump's presidency put even more strain in the system and in, 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 in a balance of power that's very complicated. The fact that, that President Biden has decided to reappear in the international arena, I think is a very positive uh, first step. But one should also bear in mind that the policy defined by, by the current administration is a policy center in the domestic realm. The notion of a putting priority to what happens in the domestic world, that middle class driven foreign policy that some refer to is, some, is clearly at the center of the definition of the Biden administration. So although the US is coming back, one should not think about the US coming back and going back to what used to be the US role in, 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 in this world. So how do we find ways to create a, a, a safety nets that help us uh, protect the, the multilateral order to, to come in a, in a more in a way that is more of a cooperation instead of confrontation should go beyond thinking about the big powers and particularly should go beyond thinking that the US will play the role that it used to play before because time has changed, have changed. And in this regard is that we believe that there is a very important opportunity to use different mechanisms where the middle powers start to play a significant, a significant role. The retooling of what we have to do now should not be thought 
in terms of the traditional powers, the, uh, we should, of course, still focus on great power dynamics, but beyond that, the middle powers should really play a significant role. And here is where I think we, we have to, we want to make the case, I want to make a case for what is called a nested multilateralism, an approach that recognizes the critical role of great power politics and places great emphasis on constraining the war's potential fallout from great power rivalry, uh, both in the security military sphere, but also in the management of public goods, but organizes small group efforts by middle powers within the multilateral system and keeps alive, alive wider, more inclusive global multilateralism, including reaching beyond states to sub-states actors. And here, this is, is something very important. We do not believe, I do not believe that we should throw away multilateralism as we know it, but we need to enrich it. And we need to enrich it bringing together middle powers that are really interested in fostering the notion and the values and the, the significance of the, uh, the contribution of multilateralism. At the same time, we need to expand the net and bring on board, for example, sub-state actors. It was proven during the, the, the Trump administration, the value of states within the United States of cities within the United States in the climate change agreement when they withdraw from it. So how to buy space for those, those new actors as much as the private sector without any doubt, and of course, a civil society. We have to uh, build a system, uh, a, 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 an order that is a, a inclusive, that has inclusive global mechanisms that play very important role, but there is a problem with inclusive global mechanisms. And that is in part, the, no, the misconception of a, the, 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 that exists in, in the system that we have to all agree to do something in order to pursue an agenda. I think that's a very, very serious problem. The misconception on consensus. Consensus is important when you are willing to work together and then you don't use consensus as a tool to stop. You try to get as far as possible and further the agenda. Well, this in a, in a moment of, of, of a important a confrontation as we are facing, is a tool that can become very dangerous. So we have to retain and keep inclusive global mechanisms, but we need to find, to find fallback uh, uh, approaches that allow for a, a smaller willing states to further the agenda. We have to find ways to, for democratic and liberal states to work together and advance key issues but that should not posit a, a, the notion that non-democratic states have no role. We have to find always this nested approach that yes, we make our case based on our views, values and principles, but we enlarge and we trans transcend what, what we are. Great power tensions also should be recognized as a baseline fact, but not, should not be treated as immutable as something that cannot be changed within the existing global affairs. And every effort should be made to channel tension into competition instead of conflict. And there again, it's very, very important to limit the fallout on multilateral arrangements of rivalry and bring this notion of competition, which is of course difficult, but middle powers should be uh, able to, to pursue and foster. Implementing a strategy of nested multilateralism will require efforts both at the level of political communications, 
and at the level of a specific policy areas. And this is something that I believe is critical. We should have new, we should make new efforts to reimagine a more resilient a more equitable globalization. We should develop a, a nested regime for the governance of technology, which is critical. And we should have, we should organize new efforts for cooperation on global public goods under the conditions of rivalry that we are facing. With all of this and quiet diplomacy, which is the fourth effort, uh, mostly by middle powers trying to develop guardrails around great power tensions and to support this notion of, of a back channel communication. With all of this, I hope we should be able to define a new landscape for this uh, notion of the, the multilateral order and find ways to pursue a better future. So with this, uh, which is very broad, is very, very uh, um, deep, and it's hard to describe in 20 minutes. Um, I hope I have uh, given a sense of what our thinking is, what we are working on. Mm -hmm.